If you remember last week, um, we had a man passed out in front of our church sign after the Sunday morning service, Sunday afternoon. And he was pretty much out of it. John and uh, Michael went up there, tried to talk to him, talked to him about the Lord, prayed with him. And at that time, he didn't want, he didn't want anything to do with it. Um, I called the police because I thought it might have been heroin. And uh, they came, they sent two uh, patrol cars, they sent an ambulance. And um, the guy was arrested because they found drugs in his pocket. And um, didn't know who it was. But, you know, you figure it might have saved the guy's life. So I asked the church this morning, I, I shared that this morning, and I asked everybody to pray for him. And so we did. We had prayer for him. Didn't even know who it was. Right after the service, he walked by the church again and just felt like he needed to come in here. And next thing I know, everybody's telling me, uh, that guy that was passed out, came in the building and uh, John was with him and brought him to my office. He was almost totally out of it. He was high on something, hadn't slept in days, cubby, brought him into my office, sat him down and I started talking to him. I said, are you the guy that last week he said, yeah, that was me. I said, what's your name? He said, Robert. What's your last name? And he told me, and I wrote it down. And <clears throat> I asked him, I said, did they, did they arrest you? And he said, yeah. And, and I, said, were, I said, were you on heroin last week? He said, no, meth. Meth's a killer. I, I have more trust in dealing with somebody on heroin because they're calm and chilled. Meth messes with their brain and they get very paranoid and they can be very violent but this guy and I said are you I said when's the last time you used meth and I thought that he said yesterday and I said you're still I said you still haven't come down yet he said no and he I kept having John wake him up and um, so I said, well, Robert, let me tell you something. I said, God led you. I said, you could have passed out anywhere last week, but you passed out at a church. I said, God brought you over here. And I said, this whole church doesn't even know who you are, but they were praying for you this morning. His head went down and he started weeping. And I let him weep for a while, and I said, Robert, I'm telling you, God is intervening in your life right now. That's why you're in here. I said, you didn't pass out at Walmart. You didn't pass out in front of somebody's yard. God led you here to a church. And I said, I've got some people in this church that have been through some rough deals. They've been through drugs, this and that and the other. And he was, it was like a mix of alcohol and meth with him. But, you know, he wasn't like tweaking, you know, like you see meth users tweak and they just cannot stand still and they, whatever. He kept falling asleep. We couldn't keep him awake. And he said that he's got to check in tomorrow at Comtree, which is Community Treatment Center. And I told him, I said, Robert, what you need is you need to be checked into a facility and He's homeless, totally homeless, been that way. And I said, what you need is you need, you need to be checked in somewhere where you can get away, you can get a bed, you can get some food, you can get away from wherever you're getting the meth, but we know that he's getting it in this neighborhood. And we pretty much know where it's coming from. And so... Um, I told him, I said, this church loves you. God loves you enough to be intervening in your life at this time to try to keep you alive. 
And I said, while God has injected himself into your life at this particular time, I think you ought to pay attention to that. I said, you believe in God, don't you? And he said, yeah. And I said, I'm telling you, God loves you enough to bring you by this church today for us to reach out to you with what God can do for your life. And he started crying again. And so um, we put together some food for him. I said, are you hungry? And he said, yeah. And I said, I'm going to give you two nights at a motel. I said, I can't help you with much. I said, I can't house you in a hotel for however long. I can't do that. What I can do is pray for you and, and encourage you. At this time in your life right now, the best thing you can do is ask God to help you. And I said, it's that simple. There's no magic words. You just cry out to God. This, the book of Psalms is full of, I cried unto the Lord. I cried out unto the Lord. When I cried, he heard me. What time I am afraid, God helps me. And I said, that's, that's, it's that simple. And I said, who knows what God will do for you? I said, but we're here to pray. And I prayed with him once again. He stuck his hand out to me. I bless his heart. I said, I want to pray for you. And he, he scooted up over the couch and stuck his hand out. I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hold your hands. And he grabbed John and by the hand and we, and Todd was there and we prayed. And I said, we got done with the prayer. And I said, now, I said, before I send you over to the motel with these two guys, we're going to go through your backpack. Make sure you don't have any weapons. I'm not, because he had already talked about how if he got real desperate, he would probably rob some people so he could get thrown in jail. And I said, you don't want to do that. You don't want, you don't want to hurt somebody else to do that. Don't do that. So they went through his stuff. I guess, I think God put that in my mind. Check this guy out before you send him over there with a church credit card for two nights at a hotel. And uh, they went through his stuff and he, he, he understood. I said, Robert, I don't know you. I don't, I, you've already talked about robbing people. And I said, I'm not going to send you over there with my two. I like you and I love you and I want to help you. But I like these two guys too. want to keep them alive. And I said, I love you. But I'm telling you, if you pull something with them over there, they're going to shoot you. He went, I understand. So anyway, uh, we're going to pray for Robert. I'm not going to give you his last name, but he is a mess. He's homeless. He said he's got a job he's working on. It's going to pay him some good money this week. And I said, but Robert, don't let the drugs get in the way. And we had to wake him up again. That's about how everything went. So as you know, I want this on the recording. I want everybody who hears this tonight to pray for Robert. He said 35. I asked him how old he was, 35, homeless. And I said, Robert, what I, I said, I don't know you, but I'm just guessing that you've got a bunch of bad stuff in your life that people have done to you over the years. And he said, yeah. And I said, you tried to bury it with drugs and alcohol. And I said, it just keeps popping back up. I said, if you'll let God, if you'll let God bury it, it'll stay buried. And you let God deal with it and let God nail it to the cross. God will, God will make it that it leaves you alone the rest of your life. You won't be haunted by it anymore. So, you know, we, we prayed over him, tried to do what we can for him. And I want God's people praying for Robert this week. And we'll just see what God does. All right. Genesis chapter 3. Let's go to the word and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Betty brought her neighbor tonight. She said, I like studying the Bible. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Amen. Do what? I'll tell you that after the service. We're, we're streaming live over the internet, and I just don't want to give his last name out, but I'll tell you after the service, okay? All right. Yeah. Uh, John, turn the room mics down. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And he said unto the woman, you look at, you pay attention now, this is our enemy. We're doing a study of the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 3. And God introduces our enemy. He's the agent of choice. The agent of choice. Yea, hath God said, let's question God's word. Let's undermine the foundation of God's word in people's life. That's the first thing he does. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. She lied there. She lied there. God never said they couldn't touch it. She added that. Let me tell you who Eve is at this point. Women in the Bible, in Bible typology language, are always a picture of a church of some kind. In this case, Eve is a religious institution that adds rules to God's commandments. And it doesn't matter if it was the Jews adding all these rules of the Old Testament or whether it's uh, Protestants adding uh, morals and standards and guidelines saying if you are like this then you are saved and if you are not like this then you're not saved or the Roman Catholic Church adding commandments to God's commandments or the Mormon Church or wh whoever does it when you add sins and commandments to the Word of God you've done damage to the Word of God we've got enough against us with just God's Word but see, man, man builds institutions and he adds rules and guidelines and things that you must comply with in order for you to be a part of their, quote, salvation. But God never said that you couldn't touch it. Now, it's a good idea that you stay away from it. Don't go around it. But God had put it in the midst of the garden next to the tree of life. So God's given man choice and Satan is the agent of that choice. Neither shall you touch it lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. He lied through his pronged teeth and his doubled tongue. Ye shall not surely die. He lied to her. Now he's going to add his own gospel. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as God's. Knowing good and evil. In other words, you're going you're gonna to gain wisdom and immortality. This is the good fruit right here. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is the divine holy fruit that if you'll eat that, you'll be enlightened and you'll be as us gods. and You'll have immortality. He lied through his poisonous teeth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for Robert tonight. I have absolutely no doubt, God, that you sent that man by here twice I, I i couldn't believe it when they told me god that he was here again i didn't think i'd ever see him lord you brought him in here and god i know you well enough to know god that you may have brought him in here for him to hear the gospel and to hear of your love for him and god he may ultimately reject it and you'll remind him of this weekend in judgment day. I pray that's not the case. Because Father we've reached out to this man. As we have others. Who have just been. Beaten down. By devils. By sin itself. By drugs. Alcohol. The lust of this world. God I hate it. I hate what sin has done. To our town our county, our communities that we live in, our neighborhoods. I absolutely, I hate it, God. I hate that there's somebody dealing drugs in this neighborhood. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would destroy the principalities and powers that are behind that. Break down their stronghold. Get them out of our neighborhood. Send angels down, dear God, to stand and fight for us. Keep us safe, Father. But, Father, we reach out to Robert. We ask you, God, Lord, that when he gets his rest and he wakes up, I pray, dear God, that he would open that Bible we gave him. He'd read it. Show him, Father, where to go to. Show him what you want him to see. God, I believe you can do that. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would save that man and 
breaking free from the bondage that he's in. As you've done with each one of us. And we're very thankful for it. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would bless us with your word tonight. Teach us about our enemy, how he works, what he's capable of doing, how he can be defeated. Help us, dear God, to stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. So last week we, we compared 2 Corinthians 11 with Genesis chapter 3. Paul said, as the serpent beguiled him through his subtlety. So he's telling you this is how the devil works. This is what he does. This is how he works against us in our lives. He, he, he pits himself against and his words against God's word. It's always against God's word. The devil's biggest enemy is the word of God. And I'll say it like this. The written word of God. What God gave to Adam, he gave by voice command. There was no written record of it at that time. So that Eve had no Bible to open up to say, this is exactly what God said for us to not do. It's as plain as day. I'm reading it and I'm going to abide by that. The devil always seeks to destroy the power and the effect of the written word of God in people's lives. He always attacks the Bible. Every, in every church, at every age, he's always gone against what God said and the fact that it's been written down. So we got to, last week we looked at Acts 13.10, he, that, um, he is, he perverts the right ways of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 11, we are to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He can be resisted. God will always give you a way of escape. Temptations will come in life. Trials and tribulations will come in life, but God will always give you the way out. You can always have a shield of defense against the fiery darts that he sends and the false doctrine and the things that he says. First Peter 5, 8, be sober. So here's this man in my office, drunk as a skunk, high on methamphetamine, has not slept in days. Devils, I, I mean, I just, I get it. He had devils all over him. And there was a battle going on in my office for this man's soul. This man's soul is at stake. This man that God sent over here is either going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. I want him to, I want him to meet Jesus and go to heaven like the rest of us are. Amen. I want that for him. I don't know him, but I want that for him. I feel bad for him. So I, the roaring lion has been attacking this man. And those of us who are strong are, are here to help the infirmities of those that are weak. Amen. So be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now turn First John. First John, we're, and we're studying the devil. We're understanding from the scripture who he is, what he does, what he's capable of, what he's not capable of. And I'm going to say this at the beginning. If you are born again, if you are truly saved, you cannot be possessed of devils. Cannot happen. There is one sitting on the throne in your heart, and that is Jesus Christ, God Almighty. And there's not room for a devil to sit next to him to take the reins over. That's a lie. So you have... Many in the, let's say the charismatic church who are teaching that a Christian can be possessed of devils, which is why you're sick and which is why you have this disease and which is why you did this sin. And we need to cast that devil out so you don't do that anymore. And what that is, is an excuse for bad behavior. It says, well, I had a devil in me. That's why I said what I said. That's why I called my husband an idiot. Or that's why I looked at this woman. Or that's why I... Drink this alcohol, whatever. It was the devil in me. It wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. 
and I just didn't cast this devil out, didn't have enough faith. That's, that's a bunch of baloney. You sin because you wanted to sin. Amen. So 1 John chapter 3 tells us this. And it, and this again goes back to Genesis 3. It connects it together. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. So, raise your hand if you've ever committed a sin. Okay? Got that out of the way. So, your flesh, your father was the devil. In your flesh, your father was the devil. Your soul has been born again. It has a different father. That inner man does not and cannot sin against God. Cannot do it. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. So now, we don't have a clock or a calendar in the Bible that tells us exactly when Satan, and he's, we'll get to Ezekiel, what is it, Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 32, something like that. We'll get into those places where we see what the devil did, but we don't have a calendar or a clock telling us exactly at what time and what day it happened. We just know that from the beginning, when God created Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, he created him as an anointed cherub, a high-ranking angel who then sought to sit on the throne of God, sought to expel God from his own throne so he could inhabit that place and sit on that throne. So it must have been very early on in the beginning process. Somewhere between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3, Pride entered into Satan's heart and he said, boy, I'd like to sit on that throne. How can I do it? I see God's creation down there. I think if I destroy that, I might be able to get it. So he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So hold your place there in first John. You look back in Genesis three after the devil tempts Eve and she eats. Then we have. Because that says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. So all the way back in Genesis 3.15, where he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Her seed is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So he's manifested and prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 that he's going to come and destroy the works that the devil has produced. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Name something in this world that you know the devil did it. Name something that's happened in this world. You know the devil was all in it. Yes. 9-11. Absolutely. Devils flying those planes into those. Those men were full of devils. Full of devils. Okay. Give me another one. Abortion. Abortion clinics everywhere the devil is a murderer. There's devils all around those places looking up the blood of the innocent sacrifices. Mm, mm, mm. Boy, that's a mess. Give me another one. These gay pride parades full of devils everywhere. That's good. Give me another one. Congress. Transgenderism. Okay? Adolf Hitler. Okay? The Russian Revolution, Cuban Revolution, communism. These things are of the devil. Okay? The greed of hypercapitalism. That's of the devil as well. The love of money is the root of all evil, the Bible says. Okay? So, I mean, you can see clearly in histor historic events. The working of evil forces in this world. So the Son of God is manifested so that He can come and destroy all of those works. You know, we were talking in my office about 
uh, uncle, my uncle Harry, who was a World War II Marine at Okinawa, the Pacific Islands, one of them tough guys that fought very evil forces. Whether they fought them from Germany or they fought them from Japan, that was pure evil. Okay? The war we fought against North Korea, again, absolute pure evil there. We send our boys over to Iraq and they're in the Gulf, they're in the Middle East. They're seeing an evil that we've never seen before in this country. They're seeing very evil people doing evil things over there. And that's all the work of the devil. The devil's responsible for wars and the mass killing of people. Mass shootings. Those people are full of devils doing that. Okay? So, and, and then it gets down to the events that have taken place in your life. Whatever this, this man, Robert, that God sent our way, this, this drug addict, whatever has gone on in his life has brought him to the place that he is right now. Messed completely up. Homeless. The man has no hope. He's never enjoyed what God can allow a man to enjoy in his life. He's never had that. The devil has stole all of that from him. Those are the works of the devil as well. It gets down not just the major historic events, but the very events that have happened in your life, things that have come against you in your life, things that have how the devil's tried to destroy you in your life. Those things are things that the devil and his angels are able to accomplish in a person's life. But those are the very events that refine us as believers in Jesus Christ. They refine and define us and make us who we are today. They make us the people of faith that we are right now. Somebody say amen. First John, so whatever, you remember what Joseph said to his brethren. When they, they're the ones that sold him into slavery. They, they were going to kill him. They sold him into slavery. He ends up being the boss over all the world. And his brothers come to him. And when he, when he says, it is I, Joseph, be not afraid. They were afraid. They were afraid. Oh my goodness, he's going to have us all killed. He's going to bring us all down here and slaughter every one of us. But he went to them and wept on their shoulders. And he said to them, what you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. And I'm here to tell you, when you live this life, you'll see it. You'll turn back and you'll look and see every rotten, evil thing that was done against you. God had a purpose in that shaping you who you are right now. Amen. First John 3.10. In, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. There's two types of people. There's only two races of people in the world. Children of God, children of the devil. And children of the devil, I've studied a lot of things in my studies. And I know that there are groups who say, oh, the children of the devil, that's all the black people. Or that's all the Jews. Or that's all the mongrel people, Hispanic people, whatever. They make that out to be every race except their own personal race. Blacks do it. Japanese do it, Asian cultures do it, whites do it, it's everywhere. But it's real simple. If you're saved, you're a child of God. If you're lost, you're a child of the devil. And you do the works. You do what your father did. I do things my daddy did. I have traits in me that my father had. Sometimes I, that annoys me. I don't want to be like him in certain ways. But that's how it is. So, two types of people. So, 1 John 3, 10 again. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. We have to love that man come in here. He's a dope fiend. He's a dope fiend. I could have, I, we could have just said, you know what? I don't like these guys. I'm going to put them down in the ground and make out like he came in here to attack us. 
That's not the way to treat him. Treat him with love. Well, what if he doesn't get saved? Then we'll end up being the same way Christ is to all of humanity. God sent forth his only begotten son to die for the whole world. Most of the whole world hates Jesus' guts and will die and go to hell and not accept his gift of salvation. But he did it for them anyway. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them, this is where he ends up. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. A, not, a, not a destruction in the sense that he's destroyed and obliterated, but a constant torment in the lake of fire. Your enemy, the one who did you all that harm, the one who deceived you, the one who lied to you, the one who put you through hell on earth, God's going to take him, put him in the lake of fire, and he's going to suffer and be tormented for eternity. Can't wait, but I'll have to. Revelation or Romans 16 says, may the God of heaven or the God of peace bruise Satan under your feet shortly. I'd like to stomp him. Amen. I don't like what he's done to me. I don't like what he tried to do to our marriage. I don't like what he tries to do in my family. I don't like what he tries to do in the church. I don't like what he's done to our country and our communities. I don't like it. I'm his enemy. And sometimes he lets me know it too. Um, we were talking downstairs earlier. Michael was having a pretty rough day yesterday. Dealing with the four children that we rescued in Kenya. And I've said this a number of times. When you live for the Lord. The devil will beat you up over it. He will beat on you. He will work against you. And you'll know it. You'll know it when it happens. Because you are not in a good place. But it does happen. God allows it. But it strengthens us. It strengthens us. It causes us to pray more. To get back into the Bible more. It's how the shepherd keeps the sheep in the fold. When the sheep in the fold think about leaving the fold, God sends a wolf outside the fold to scare us back in the fold. Because who wants to be back in the lion's jaws or the wolf's jaws? Amen? I don't want that. Um, let's see here. Yeah. First Chronicles 21, a picture of Satan. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. The devil is an agent of provocation. Provocation. He will provoke you to do things that you know is not right to do. He'll bring situations about. He'll, I believe the devil has the ability to speak into your head. Speak to your soul. Who believes that? Okay, I do. So, he and his devils, I've heard them multiple times telling me, get out, leave, go on, move on, get out. You're, we don't want you here. We're going to destroy you. We're going to kill you. We're going we're gonna to ruin you. And the devils like to provoke people to sin or to compromise or to let their guard down or to stop praying or to stop reading their Bible, quit attending church service, things like that. He likes to provoke us to sin. Mark chapter 1 verse 13, He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. Satan tempts Eve, succeeds in causing Adam and Eve to fall, he tries the same thing with Jesus. Tempted him with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, 
pride of life, Jesus succeeded where man failed. But he's the tempter. He and his... I don't think the devil is omnipresent. I don't think he can be everywhere all at once. So he has angels under him. Messengers of Satan, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. To buffet the saints. And to tempt sinners and entice them and get them in the grip of sin. It's what he does. And he does it very well. He knows your weaknesses. Does he not? Okay. So maybe you can't be tempted with lust of the eyes. But you can be tempted with lust of the flesh. Or you can be tempted with pride. Whatever it is with you, the devils who are around you know you well enough to know what works and what doesn't. Mark chapter 4 verse 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So here's our brother Tim Barons in Las Vegas handing out gospel tracts. With, and these tracts, I know they're chick publication tracts and they have full of scripture verses. And he's handing these tracts out. People take a look at them. They're in Las Vegas, they're in Sin City, devil sitting on their shoulder going, don't, don't read that, throw that away. So there's no doubt that landfills outside the Las Vegas area are full of chick publication tracts that Tim Barron's handed to people that immediately were tossed in the trash. Immediately. That's what he does. When the word, this is why God gave us the word in a book. That we can carry with us. And bless God. Now that we live in this age. We can take it with us in our phones and tablets. Everywhere we go we can have the word of God. Everywhere we go we can have the word of God. But the devil. You can carry it around for weeks and never read it. Never open it up. Never look at it. Never listen or give heed to the word of God being preached. But that's what he does. He tries to block the effect of faith and the work of the Word of God in a person's life. I, I guarantee you, Todd, that that man has got devils working all over him. Because he came in a church. And a church... This church, I know this church. I know what we have for him. We have salvation and peace and freedom. They don't want that. So they're going to work hard on this guy. And they're going to work hard against us. They're going to beat us up for that. Get ready for it. You get ready to have a rotten week this week. Praise Jesus. Amen. Luke 13. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Satan puts people in bondage. The word we use now is addictions. Alcohol. Drugs. Some people have a stealing addiction. Some people have a lust addiction. George Michael sang that song, I'm addicted to love. It's not love he was addicted to. That's not love. How he lived his life, man doesn't know a thing about love. What he knows about is gratification. And that's how he lived his life. That's how he died. Died of sodomite too. Okay? But it's addictions. That's bondage. The devil loves to put from the earliest age... That he can. To put people in bondage. I've had. Several families. Of late. Contact me. Phone. Email. Message. However. And tell me. Pastor. Pray for our families. Our children. Our young children. We can see. The devil already creeping in. 
to our family. We can see our daughters and our sons already getting tastes of this world and they love it too much. And we try to stop it and all we get is a big war. It's a battle going on for our children. Somebody say amen to that. I'm telling you, it's real. Okay? But he, at the youngest age possible, get them in bondage so he can have them the rest of their... This man is 35 years old. He's not even middle age yet. And he has no life whatsoever. He doesn't have a resume. Doesn't have a home to live in. He's got nothing. 35 years old. And the man has absolutely nothing. Except two nights at a hotel given to him by a church. And a plate of food. That started, because I, I asked him, I said, you're 35. When's the first time you used? He said, 13. He's been on drugs since he was 13 years old. But I promise you, other things started way back before then. You want proof of that? Revelation 12, there's the devil who's going to devour the man-child as soon as it's born. Get them as young as possible. So you can have them in bondage. For the, the longer they're in bondage, the harder it is to get out. Take meth one time, you may not go back to it. But most people who do meth one time will either die or spend the next 20 years trying to crawl out of it. Uh, Luke 22, verse 3, Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, being of the number of twelve. Satan and his devils have the power to inhabit lost souls. Lost souls. Judas was never saved, was never right, even though Jesus chose him, but he chose him for a reason, knowing what he would do. Knowing that he would turn against him. Satan has the power and his devils have the power to inhabit and take over the minds of those who are lost. Not saved people. He can pressure you. Bark at you. Squawk at you. Say things to you. But he cannot force you to do anything. It's different when you're lost. They can inhabit a lost person and make them do things. And in, we know from the Bible in one case. Giving them the ability to break iron chains and walk across hot coals. Okay, so he has the power to inhabit those who are lost. Luke twenty two thirty one. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. The devil likes to put oppression and controversy and contradiction in our lives. But think about what that's doing. If you're the wheat, the husk that's on the wheat is no good. So I don't know why they started putting it on the top of bread. I don't like it. Whatever. But it's no good. There's nothing good about that husk. It's the germ on the inside. That's where the DNA is. That's where the real power of the seed is. Jesus said, except a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die. So when that crust comes off, what's on the inside can be revealed. So God, watch this now. You went through turmoil. You went through trouble. You had trials. Satan sifting you as wheat. But what's he doing? Destroying the works of the flesh in your life so that the man of God on the inside can be revealed. Amen. That's the devil's purpose. God sent him here. Do you think that the devil is just running loose doing whatever he wants to do against God's? No. Satan. I mean, we know this from the book of Job. That Satan is restricted by God from doing certain things. God draws a line and tells Satan, don't you dare cross that line. 
Because Satan knows if he does, God will pick him up, throw him in a lake of fire right then and there, or the bottomless pit. He knows that. So do all the devils. When Jesus showed up, these devils would cry out, Oh, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, what have we to do with thee before the time? They know they're going to get tossed in the pit one day. They just don't want it to be today. That sounds like a lot of lost people. I know I'm dying going to hell. I just don't want to do it today. Right? Acts chapter 5. We'll close with this. Acts chapter 5. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? The inspiration. Listen to this now. The inspiration for the lies you told came from the devil. There's some people that I know that are expert liars. They're good at it. I had a young man in my office several years ago. He grew up in this church. And right now his life, he's way gone. But he sat in my office and told me in no uncertain terms, I know that I'm a liar and I'm very good at it. Told me that, Ron, in my office. Satan is the one who plants these lies in our hearts to tell people. Lying to other people, lying to ourselves, lying to our family, lying to our church friends, our church family, lying to the Holy Ghost. When you lie to the Holy Ghost, you're out. In Acts 26, 18, he says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. So Satan's domain is always in darkness. Think of the two lights in Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter one, the fourth day of creation. The greater light to rule over the day, that's the sun. The lesser light to rule over the night, that's the moon. The prince of darkness, he's called. Okay? So the power of Satan lies in the darkness. Darkness is the absence of the Bible, the Word of God, the absence of prayer, the absence of God's people in a certain situation. Darkness comes where there's alcohol, where there's drugs, where there's fornication, pornography. There's darkness with lies. There's darkness with murder. People don't normally kill people in plain sight in front of everybody. They do it hidden so they don't get caught. But that's the darkness. I don't know. I do not. I'm telling you. This man who used to be the security chief for Joyce Meyer's ministry who killed his wife and his two sons. That man was full of devils. How can you look at your, your son, your offspring in the eyes while you're choking him to death just because you've got a slut down in Florida that you want to shack up with? Joyce wouldn't let him get divorced because he'd lose his position. So he thought, well, if I kill my wife and then blame it on somebody else, well, then, I, then I'll be able to shack up with this other gal that I really love. And he murdered his two sons and his wife, looking them in the eyes. That man is full of devils. Still, he still tries to pass it off like he didn't do it. He didn't do it. And there's other situations I've seen on the internet. I follow something. There's a guy out in Colorado somewhere. Again, another woman's involved. So instead of leaving his pregnant wife with his two or three other children, goes home one night, kills them, takes them out. He works in the oil fields out in Texas or somewhere, buries his wife's body, takes his little children's body and shoves them down inside of an oil tank. That's evil. That man's full of devils. Full of devils. But anyway, God wants to open their eyes and turn them from the darkness to light and from the power of Satan and the God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He's got power. He's got power. He may have power over your flesh, but he can't touch your soul. If you are saved, it belongs to Jesus. And Jesus don't let them go. Amen.
Boy, it's good. We're, we're learning some things. Learning about our enemy. The things that apply to Satan and his power in a lesser way. There are lesser angels who have a more limited type of power. That's kind of what I, what I believe and what I see. There's like a hierarchy of angels. Some have great power, some don't have. Consider Michael trying to come back to give the message to Daniel and he's being withstood by the prince of the people of Persia, which I think is probably Satan. 21 days, these two angels fought it out. That's a lot of power. Okay, God finally prevailed. Anyway, he's got power, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Good study tonight. Good study. You're going to pray for Robert. Pray for Robert. He needs prayed for. He needs the power of light, the power of the gospel. He needs to cry out to God. Did he have that Bible in his backpack? Did you see that in there? I ain't kidding you. We pulled everything out of his backpack, went through it, make sure he didn't have a weapon. I said, I, I want to help you, but you're not going to kill my guys. They'll shoot you now. I'm telling you, they'll shoot you dead. So he, I got a fist bump from him. He's very appreciative of this church, and so you pray for him, okay? That's our mission this week. We're going to pray for Robert. You folks online, pray for Robert, all right? Father in heaven, we love you. In the nasty pit that you pulled each one of us out of, God, we never want to go back to it, ever. Want nothing to do with it. And Father, we look at lost people now. see ourselves the way we used to be. We don't want that. We don't want that for him either. So Father, we lift Robert up tonight. I can't save him. You can. I couldn't even hardly keep him awake. You can. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that when he wakes up, what would be on his mind is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that in whatever manner, Lord, he would cry out to you. You are the judge of this man's heart. You'll know, Father, if he's faking or if he's for real. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would save him. Save him. Free him from the bondage that he's in. Help him, dear God, to find the happiness and the joy that comes from just being human in this world. And then, Father, added to that the joy of serving you. God, he doesn't know what that's like. We do, and we thank you for it. We ask you, God, Lord, that you would do that in his life. Bless these that have come. Bless these that have watched online. I pray, dear God, that you bless your word now. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.